What is the DSA? A panel presented by a Northwestern University chapter of the Platypus Affiliated Society. The Platypus Affiliated Society, established in December of 2006, organizes reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism focused on problems and tasks inherited from the old 1920s to 30s, new 60s through 70s, and post-political left, which is the 80s and 90s, the possibilities of emancipatory politics today. We have a chapter at Northwestern University, now online during the pandemic, which runs a year-long Marxist reading group, coffee breaks, and public fora. If you want to, here's a sign-up sheet for those who want to get involved in activities. You can also find the Platypus Review, our forum in print, online at platypus1917.org. So today our panel is on the question, what is the DSA? The Democratic Socialists of America experienced phenomenal growth following the Sanders campaign and the election of Donald Trump did the 28 and the election of Donald Trump did the 2018 midterms. Following the defeat of Sanders' second run, the reemergence of Black Lives Matter, and the election of Joe Biden, what are the goals and tasks of the DSA? Is this a moment for the advancement for the struggle of socialism? If so, what does this mean? And might this represent a transformation of the DSA itself? What lessons from history might, if possible, help such an advance? And our panelists in order they'll be presenting are Andrew Basta of the, I just lost my place. Andrew Basta of the Young Democratic Socialists of America at University of Chicago. Welcome, Andrew. Jack Clark of the Metro DC Democratic Socialists of America, a member of North Star Caucus and a founding national secretary of the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee. Welcome, Jack. Jamal Abed Rebo of the Chicago Democratic Socialists of America, a member of the Clash Unity Caucus and a recent PhD in history from the University of Chicago. Welcome, Jamal. Thanks, nice to be here. And finally, Lance Selfa of the International Socialist Project. Welcome, Lance. Hi. So the way this is going to work is we're going to give each of the panelists about 10 minutes to give their opening remarks. And I'll signal you and you have two minutes left. We'll follow that with a quick round of responses so that the panelists may respond to each other at a maximum of about three minutes. And then we'll open up the, we'll open up the audience question and answer. In the audience, you'll be able to ask a question, preferably by raising your hand so you can be recognized to say your question loud, or if you'd like, just by writing in the Q&A box. <laughs> Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Andrew. Awesome. Thanks so much, Clint. Um, so hello, comrades. My name is Andrew Basta. I see him pronouns. I've been a DSA member for about three years, uh, since January of 2018, actually. So a uh, few years in a month. Um, I, in that time I've helped to found and organize a YDSA chapter at my high school, a American high school, served the year as the co-chair of my local DSA chapter in New York, Lower Hudson Valley DSA. I have worked with other organizers. Now to start a YDSA chapter at the University of Chicago. Um, I also serve on the as a member of the National BDS in Palestine Solidarity Working Group uh, and on the DSA International Committee. Um, as Clay mentioned, uh, we saw tremendous growth of DSA over the last four years. Um, and it is essential that we look back at this growth to see why this has happened and why DSA now is, I think, the major player of the American left. Um, I think we, to look at the root of this, we have to like kind of start at the Bernie uh, 2016 campaign. And in this campaign, we saw DSA adopt a really flexible approach to support them. And rather than focusing on the faults of Sanders' campaign or Sanders himself um, or the slogans they use, I mean, DSA recognized that this campaign was a campaign that had massive effect upon the workers' movement. Um, Sanders uh, was organizing sections of the Democratic Party uh, based along class lines. Um, and the organic organization that grew out of that Sanders phenomenon uh, broke naturally with the Democratic Party campaign. Um, so joining DSA, uh, the socialist formation that was at the forefront of organizing within in that campaign became a clear next step uh, in the struggle. Um, and, I, and I think this growth has really massively transformed DSA's goals. I mean, I think now we can see the DSA, or the task of DSA is to become a mass working class organization uh, made to contest for power and continue the struggle for socialism. Um, although I'm quite obviously DSA in most places is not there yet. Um, members across chapters, large and small, I think have that task clearly set out. Um, 
And in this, I think we do see a bit of a di divergent path on the role DSA has played in the pa past. I mean, DSA was not built with the structures for this type of mass organization of the working class. Um, just as an easy example, uh, I'm currently working with comrades in New York State on a statewide tax the rich campaign. And um, what we can see with that is there is no regional structure for chapters to organize together. Like we had to create that at the very beginning, which was quite long and which, I mean, just having the structure of a national leadership um, being the national political committee and then local chapters is somewhat absurd structurally for trying to build power. I mean, and what this reflects reflect is the weakness or death of the left um, pre-2010, I'll say. Um, DSA chapters were mostly one's email lists. Uh, most regular activities uh, were reading groups or isolated public events. Um, DSA members were often members of the new left, maybe the post left and were longtime socialists. They weren't young people who were getting involved in the class struggle. Um, so now as we see in DSA transform into I think an 85,000 member organization after the recruitment drive, we can see the task of DSA um, becoming this power be much more separate from DSA's task in the past. Um, and, and, and it's also that chapters across the country have like led campaigns to explicitly build power for the working class. One of the notable areas where this comes into play is in electoral work where DSA is famous for. I mean, whether in the Bernie campaign, AOC, Tlaib, Bush or Bowman for Congress or in the many state and local races, DSA has done those campaigns with the intention of building power, whether that means um, maintaining DSA control of DSA campaign efforts, mass canvassing to actually shift working class consciousness and not just stuff enough ads down uh, the TV uh, line or whatever. Um, we, we've seen DSA do this consciously to build power. And we've seen this outside of electoral work, even though less reported on, that that was um, the local Chicago branch working all out to uh, support the labor strike at uh, the University of Illinois uh, in Chicago. Um, and, and I think this is even most present in YDSA organizing and YDSA chapters across the country. I mean, we can see Columbia YDSA, about 30 bucks up from me right now, um, just launched a huge uh, tuition strike um, we're working to actually build power for working class students who, who, who attend there um, and, and really shifting powers away from the schools and the universities they attend. So, so, so I really think we can see DSA and YDSA really building power and that being the task and continuing the socialist struggle um, in DSA now that we've grown, expanded and had a really flexible approach uh, to politics. Um, so I sincerely hope that the left can develop grow and build to materially transform working people's lives and build a mass socialist working class organization in the process, that being DSA. Uh, thanks. Cool. Now we're gonna get on to Jack from there. Yep. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, thanks for uh, including in this forum. Kevin and I had talked somewhat in advance of this and I'm consciously not in my opening remarks addressing DSA strategy right now, I'm taking rather an historical look uh, at DSA's origins and more narrowly uh, the DSOC piece of DSA origins because that's where I come from as, as uh, Clay mentioned, I was the founding national secretary of DSOC. And looking at an attempt to frame politics in a mainstream context, a DSOC really sought very much to be a fresh start on the American left. Um, we were founded in 1973. Uh, NAM has its own very proud history and uh, was founded uh, around that same time, I think maybe a year earlier or a year and a half earlier than we were. Uh, and all of us were responding at that point to uh, the breakup of the 60s left and what comes next and how do you, how do you respond to that? Uh, and DSOC did, in fact, succeed in having a lot of fresh voices and fresh aspects to it. Uh, a very active religion and socialism caucus, which hadn't been um, really a major theme in American socialism since um, for decades, 
Uh, Norman Thomas has come out of a social uh, gospel tradition, but uh, there hadn't been there hadn't been much of that in a long time. Uh, there was uh, an attempt to break with some of the cultural um, sense of the old socialist party, which was very um, set in its ways on issues like feminism and th those kinds of things. And there was uh, some fresh thinking there as well. Uh, but much as we so sought consciously to be a fresh force in, um, in American politics and to bring in a lot of people who hadn't uh, been involved before, our roots really were in that old socialist party and specifically in what was called the realignment tendency. And the realignment tendency goes back at least to the 1950s, although again, we're having some informal discussion about this earlier. Uh, the realignment tendency also borrowed heavily from the popular front period of the communist party where the CP was able to maintain an independent identity, play a very active role in the CIO at the same time that it was clearly identified with and driving the left wing of the New Deal. Uh, the uh, even earlier, the 1924 Progressive Party campaign where uh, La Follette uh, took the indep an independent nomination and secured the support of the Socialist Party, but also of uh, the Railroad Brotherhoods and the major uh, AFL unions was also this kind of attempt to bring together a left wing force that could potentially become a major force in American politics. And the people in that 1924 campaign, I think anticipated that they would displace one of the major parties, which ended up not happening. But this is an ongoing uh, effort, uh, again, in the 50s, with the breakup of the old Communist Party, uh, the 20th Party Congress speech, lots of people leaving in disillusion, but still holding on to left-wing politics, the growth of the civil rights movement. There's a an upsurge of thinking that um, there can be a left force in American politics operating through the Democratic Party that, uh, and I wanna be really clear on this because I think there's a misunderstanding uh, on this. Nobody uh, as, uh, associated with the realignment tendency ever thought the realignment tendency had anything to do with socialists taking over the Democratic Party. Socialists were too few and too discredited to even think in those kinds of terms. But it did have to do with trying to create a principled liberal party, uh, getting rid of the Dix Dixiecrats, uh, and forming a solid coalition of labor, uh, the civil rights movement, um, and enlightened middle class uh, uh, progressives in the in and around uh, things like the SANE and the uh, uh, anti-nuclear bomb movement and uh, uh, all sorts of other. Uh, emerging uh, liberal tendencies uh, growing at the time. And within that context, the, the idea was that uh, socialists could have a greater intellectual influence on the shaping uh, mainstream American politics. I want to stress just for a minute or two, and then I'm going to get specifically to where we came from on this, that the realignment tendency had some real successes in trying to re re reach those goals. The 1963 March on Washington, which was led by A. Philip Randolph, um, really embodied a lot of social democratic demands. And uh, in the day after the march, it is a, if you look through the collected works of I.F. Stone, he has an essay about uh, uh, forums and uh, uh, meetings taking place around that and talking about the strong influence of socialist demands on shaping the civil rights agenda. A few years later, the Freedom Budget for All Americans, which the A. Philip Randolph Institute issued, uh, was really a pretty far-reaching radical document with a lot of mainstream liberal support for a real economic renewal of American life. Uh, all of that was promising, and there was some really good work that went into it. And it fell apart around the visions on the uh, war in Vietnam, and below the surface, all the people weren't nearly as aware of it at the time as they became a few years later, growing white backlash to the uh, gains of the civil, right, civil rights movement. So the, this grand coalition that Harrington and others uh, anticipated was already starting to come apart. And you can see that coming clearly into focus in 1967, although the uh, formal dissolution of the realignment tendency came later. Uh, 
Martin Luther King uh, gives his famous Riverside Church sermon, breaking with uh, LBJ on over the war in Vietnam, saying, I can't be a, a proponent of nonviolence uh, here when the United States is the greatest provider of violence in the world. At that point, Bayard Rustin, who's one of the major leaders in the uh, realignment tendency, doesn't fully break with King, but the break starts. Uh, Rustin, a few months later, opposes King's effort to uh, form the, uh, to uh, create the poor people's movement. King in turn recruits Michael Harrington to write the economic program of the poor people's movement. This predates, but also uh, reflects very clearly where the division has come down a couple of years later. Uh, the Socialist Party uh, falls apart. The uh, majority tendency calls itself Social Democrats USA. Uh, the people who are the leaders in that tendency who had all been in the realignment uh, grouping uh, have become very influential within the top echelons of the AFL-CIO. Uh, Lane Kirkland, I don't think ever became a member, but was a very close confidant. Uh, Tom Kahn, who's a leader of this, becomes a speechwriter for Meany. Uh, they take an active role in the anyone but McGovern movement in the 72 uh, Democratic uh, primaries and Democratic convention uh, and actively push the neutrality uh, uh, position on the AFL-CIO in 1972. Uh, all of that leads to a, uh, a breakup. And about a year later, the uh, uh, DSOC emerges, again, very consciously not positioning itself as a split off from Social Democrats USA, but as a, a fresh voice bringing in, and honestly bringing in people who hadn't been around before. Uh, so that's that's where, that's where we come from. I had uh, intended to try to keep my remarks brief. I just got my two minute warning. I think that is enough of the history. I'll, I'll be glad to get into more in discussions and I reserve the right to uh, offer opinions and some of the things I'm not covering here. Okay, um, so now we're gonna go on to Jamal. All right, uh, thanks Clay and Kevin for organizing this uh, panel and uh, thanks for your remarks, Andrew and Jack. I'm looking forward to hearing yours as well, uh, Lance. Uh, do let me know if you can't hear me or if there are any audio troubles, but otherwise I'll get started. So um, my name is Jamal Abedrabo. I'm a member of Chicago DSA and the DSA Class Unity caucus. Um, and I'd like to begin my, my remarks by acknowledging two things uh, about the DSA. The first is that today's DSA is the largest and most important socialist organization in the United States since at least the 1970s, and possibly even since the heyday of the Communist Party before the Red Scare. The second is that at the same time, the DSA is objectively a bit of a shit show. Um, its decentralized structure and politically naive, predominantly middle-class millennial membership have left it vulnerable to a truly tremendous array of opportunistic wrecking and Democratic Party or NGO complex careerism. In other words, the DSA is contradictory. It's not enough to say that the DSA is good or the DSA is bad. The DSA is both good and bad because it's a site of political conflict. And my argument here is that Marxists and those who prioritize class struggle more broadly have made a serious mistake in refusing to engage with the DSA. This political quietism has contributed to the organization's political and ideological regression since the height of the Bernie bounce in 2016, 2017. When Marxists refuse to fight, liberals win, no surprise. Uh, nevertheless, it's fashionable uh, for certain sectors seeking to justify their refusal to contest power within the DSA to insist that the DSA's present trajectory has been predetermined by its Harringtonite origins and historical ties to the Democratic Party. This is false. There was almost total membership replacement in 2016 to 17, and there is no longer any or much institutional memory of Harringtonism. Uh, at North Star notwithstanding. The ideology of the DSA's leadership, which some have labeled neo-Harringtonism, is in fact convergent evolution. It has no actual intellectual genealogy to true Harringtonism. And this convergent evolution is brought about by a discrete set of material incentives towards Democratic Party collaborationism, such as careerism in the political campaign and NGO complex spheres. Incentives are not unique to the DSA. We saw them at work also in the ISO, uh, which obviously had a very different history. Um, the, another argument put forward is that the DSA's pres president trajectory is dictated by its professional managerial class, or at least its larval 
professional managerial class composition. And this is closer to the mark, but it still absolves the Marxist left of responsibility for its quietism and inaction. The reality is that the only political forces that have been active and organized in the DSA since 2016 until very recently with class unity uh, have been anarchists and liberal careerists. Uh, and as such, it's no wonder that they've been able to take this strike the organization because they were almost unopposed internally. But there are uh, reasons to believe that it didn't have to have turned out this way and that if Marxists are willing to, to get their hands dirty a little bit, that we might be able to salvage something of this organization. Um, the first reason in my mind is that the DSA's membership is clearly to the left of its own leadership. You can see the recent Biden endorsement controversy. You can look to that as evidence of this. Um, the DSA's leadership um, or a significant fraction thereof basically tried to do a backdoor endorsement of the Biden campaign in spite of the fact that the membership at the last convention had passed a Bernie or bus resolution explicitly refusing that possibility. Um, there are plenty of other examples that we can touch on of the DSA's membership basically uh, acting in a much more principled fashion than the leadership. Um, the problem is that most DSA members don't come to meetings. Uh, even most well-run chapters struggle to get much above 10% attendance. Um, a lot of major chapters regularly fail to meet quorum and have to result to Robert's Rules chicanery to get around that. Um, but the fact that they don't come to meetings doesn't mean that they can't be organized. The PMC careerists have taken over the leadership, but I think our experience in Class Unity shows that if you provide an alternative, a lot of the membership is willing to listen. Um, another point I'd like to make is that any other organization on the left that arises will face similar challenges to the DSA. If we start a workers party or a labor party or a people's party that begins to see some success, it's not like the wreckers and the careerists will leave it alone. Um, we're gonna have to learn to stand and fight and beat them on the train of political contestation. Uh, similarly, it's not at all unusual for a left party to have a disproportionately middle-class membership. Actually, that's more the rule than the exception. Um, the way forward isn't to just throw up your hands and give up. We have to learn to educate that membership about the importance of subordinating itself to the working class proper. And we have to attract working class membership in sufficient numbers that they will alter the class composition of the organization. Um, so going forward, the DSA must be transformed into an organization capable of attracting and representing the working class, politically independent from the Democratic Party. Class Unity is the only Marxist caucus active in the DSA at the national level. If Marxists despair at the state of the DSA, they should join us and fight the good fight, unless there's a better alternative. And I'm very much willing uh, to listen if anyone has one in mind. Um, but I think there are more Marxists and regular people receptive to class politics waiting to be organized in the DSA uh, than there ever will be willing to join, you know, Trotskyist or post-Trotskyist group of schools. Um, the goals and tasks of the DSA as it currently exists are less important than the goals and tasks of Marxists vis-a-vis -vis the DSA. This is the largest socialist organization country for all its flaws, and it's uh, usually the first socialist organization that working class Americans join when they're new to socialism. If Marxists want to raise class and help construct a genuine working class movement, there is no alternative to working with at least one foot in the DSA, at least for now. As for what we should be doing in the DSA, um, we need political education to introduce the membership to class politics. We need to build capacity at the local level to elect and hold to account politicians who are independent of the Democratic Party and its NGO complex, including the progressive wing of the same. Uh, we need to fight for universal benefits like Medicare for all, unions, and universal child care uh, to bring the message of class struggle uh, to regular working people. Um, so I, I guess I'll conclude by just saying that, you know, the DSA is deeply flawed. Um, I don't think there is anyone who would gainsay that. Um, but it's also uh, a tremendous opportunity for the left if we actually seize it. And for the past several years, I've heard a lot of excuses from people as to why, oh, you know, we can't be involved in the DSA. They're just Democrats and so on and so forth. Well, to the extent that the DSA are quote unquote just Democrats, it's because people with better politics haven't been involved. Um, and at a certain point, you've got to put your money where your mouth is and sort of fight the good fight, even if you might lose, because even in losing, uh, you know, your Marxists will be much better off if they learn how to organize, um, you know, politically disaffected people who are drawn to socialism by the Bernie campaign, learn how to you know, uh, to, to educate them in, in true class politics. Um, 
I think that will be much more productive than sort of spinning our wheels and, and trying to build the same sort of um, minor Trotskyist party that's failed over and over again for the past however many decades. Um, and with that, um, I will surrender the floor to Lance. Yep. Um, unmuted, okay. Okay, well, I want to thank, uh, start by thanking the organizers of the panel for inviting me to participate. Um, you know, I do view these kind of discussions between comrades as essential to developments on the left in the next period. And I, I want to stress that whatever criticisms we have of each other's positions or perspectives should always be understood within the context that we stand on the same side in the fight against Trump and the right and the fight for a socialist future. Um, now, of course, I'm a bit of an outlier here, as I think I'm the only person who's not a self-identified member of DSA on this panel. Therefore, I feel a bit reticent to proclaim what you know DSA's goals and tasks should be or what the DSA should do, given that those are debates really internal to the membership of the DSA. However, I think that you know, having been an activist and member of the International Socialist Tendency for all of my adult life may give me at least some ability to make some observations on the left including DSA, today. And that's something of the purpose of the International Socialist Project, to advance a series of propositions and perspectives based on historical experience as part of a dialogue with people who are coming to the socialist movement today. Now, the one thing I will say about the DSA and its position on the left, which I think is actually in agreement with what some of the earlier speakers have said, is that its growth and large membership make what it does, what strategic initiatives it takes, um, consequential for the left today. So to many people, DSA represents what socialism is today. Um, and so for tens of thousands who joined out of the Sanders campaigns and the others who represent the new socialist movement, the DSA will help to define what direction the socialist movement is going to take. Now, I mean that in a couple of senses. First, the weight of the DSA as the largest socialist organization in the country will set the pace for the left, whether it intends to or not. And this isn't just an, in ideological debates, but also in practical on the ground activity in the labor and social movements. So what the DSA does or doesn't do will have impacts in, in all those arenas. Second, how other forces on the left position themselves in, around, or against the DSA will also have an impact on how the left develops in the future. Now, the tradition that I come from that stands for what Hal Draper called socialism from below came into existence as a revolutionary challenge to the dominant socialist politics of the post-World War II left, Stalinism and social democracy. Now, our tradition characterized these two political traditions as forms of socialism from above, which depended on politicians or bureaucracies or tanks <laughs> to deliver social, quote, socialism to the masses. And in our view, this idea vitiated the core of socialism that Marx, Engels, Lenin, Trotsky, Gramsci, Luxembourg, Mariatagi, among others, who stressed that socialism was a self-emancipation of the working class achieved by the working class itself. Socialism from below was our attempt to reclaim that emancipatory core of Marxism and socialism away from a notion that socialism was what existed in Sweden or in the old USSR or China or Cuba or wherever. Um, so I take that historical detour to bring us back to today, because I think that in some ways we're back uh, to a time where the definition of socialism is up for grabs. Uh, we're in a period where neither, um, neither of what seem to be the monolithic pillars of Stalinism or social democracy have the power that they did uh, prior to 1989, say. But in the US, where socialism has traditionally been weaker than in most other places, the newest and most dynamic element in the left today is an echo of that post-war social democracy, perhaps blended with 1930s, 40s popular front communist parties or the 1970s Euro communist parties. One has only to read Jacobin to see um, those re historical references uh, raised again and again. Now I realize that DSA is a big tent organization with many contending forces within it. And I assume there are many individuals in it who have politics that are virtually identical to mine. But we have to judge organizations on the basis of their stated programs, ideologies, and practice. Now, I think we could say that DSA's practice has been predominantly electoral and predominantly oriented around the Sanders campaign. This would fit with the characterization of the organization as the 21st century US equivalent of those earlier social democratic or Euro communist efforts. The DSA has also gained support from veterans of the socialist left who gave up building an independent socialist alternative in favor of supporting social democratic candidates running as Democrats. Uh, the earlier speakers referred to the ISO. I think this is one of the things that did actually um, impact the ISO. 
This left put most of its eggs in the basket of Bernie Sanders' runs in the Democratic Party primaries, but the Sanders camp challenge flamed out as the Democratic primary electorate aligned itself with the Democratic establishment's preference for a mainstream, anybody but Trump figure in Biden. The final stage of this process emerged in the fall when many of these socialists, um, the leading figures of Jacobin, people who had been the theorists of the dirty break and so forth, um, urged to vote for Biden, often justifying their moves with amped up rhetoric about saving the US from fascism or from a Trump coup. Now, of course, the Trump coup has sort of descended into farce now. Um, but those popular front arguments gave leftists a rationale for supporting the neoliberal ticket of Biden-Harris against Trump. And that includes people from the tradition that is associated with myself, uh, with, with the one that I come from, such as Dan Labatz at uh, New Politics. Um, now, just around the time that much of this left was refocusing its attention on the election of Biden, the uprising after George Floyd's murder took place. It created, by some estimates, the largest social movement in U.S. history. And while thousands of members of the DSA took part in the protests, and the, the organization itself was found lacking for not mobilizing around the uprising. And here I'm not just throwing rocks from the outside. I'm quoting self-criticisms from DSA uh, members that I've, I've read in a number of venues. It was an illustration of, the, of its fundamental electoralist orientation. So when comrades talk about building power through elections, I think that that, that puts, that puts elect, elections and electoralism on a much higher level than, it, than I think that the, um, the uh, traditional communist or socialist um, point of view, which saw electoral politics as subsidiary to the struggle for socialism on the ground in the working class and in, in the social movements, such as um, the one around Black Lives Matter over the summer. Now that the election is over, what has the left gained? Now let's not forget that people like Sanders and um, Rep. Uh, Alexander Ocasio-Cortez actively promoted Biden and mobilized people who were in the streets in May and June to the ballot box. The Biden-Sanders Commission drew up a, a number of policy planks, but it rejected the Green New Deal, Medicare for All, a ban on fracking, and other progressive positions. So after they have willingly signed on to the campaign while agreeing to put aside their signature policies, they can't credibly criticize Biden for not running on these issues. Uh, on this point, uh, AOC is actually more honest in admitting that she compromised than I think are the Social Democrat Monday morning quarterbacks at Jacobin. Now there remains the mantra about vote for Biden today so we can fight him tomorrow, yet we can predict that tremendous pressure will be exerted on the left once Biden takes office with a narrow House majority and with, as likely, the GOP in charge of the Senate. Uh, the left will be pressed to stand with Biden, who will be, do, be said to be doing his best he can with conservatives calling the shots in Congress and with the right wing mobilization in the streets over the next couple of years. Trump may be out of the White House, but Trumpism is going to live on. And as we become painfully aware, the election season never ends. Now, the summer's racial justice uprising showed another path to progress, that of, that of mass struggle. But without an independent socialist politics and organization, even a massive movement risks being dissipated or diverted into voter mobilizations for the Democrats. There have actually been debates recently in Black Lives Matter about just that particular thing. Now, the next few years are going to be difficult. I don't agree with those in and around the DSA who cite the elections of a few dozen Democratic Socialist representatives as evidence that socialism is winning, not when the U.S. working class is facing terrible conditions from the pandemic, unemployment, food insecurity, and evictions. Those aren't the conditions in which the working class movement is confident in winning. Navigating the next few years will require much more than a reformist understanding of how society changes. We'll be living with a mainstream Democratic administration that will most likely be hamstrung from the start. The pandemic will continue to wreak havoc into the next year or more. And finally, the right will gain more footing as it grows in op quote, opposition to the administration. Are we being set up for a Trump comeback or a more competent Trump-like figure to take over in 2024? The only thing that can alter that course of events is mass struggle, working class struggle, and a genuine commitment to political activity independent of the Democrats' electoral calculations. The good news about the otherwise awful year of 2020 is that millions experienced a political awakening. The challenge for the socialist left is to prepare itself to offer political and organizational alternatives to a militant minority of them. Now, socialists committed to this position should be now laying the groundwork for a renewal of the politics of socialism from below in preparation for the time when mass struggle along the lines of what we saw in the spring, but also more challenging to capitalist relations. 
The last time that the revolutionary left grew across the world was in the post-68 time of revolutionary upheaval that broke through the domination of Stalinism and social democracy. We have yet to approach that political conjuncture, but to, to me, that's where the hope uh, for the future lies. And I think this is an argument that will be um, taken uh, both inside and outside the, the, the DSA, uh, and I hope that uh, we'll continue along those lines today. Awesome. Thank you, Lance. So thank you to all the panelists. Now we're going to have time for some responses uh, for each of you to respond to one another. Thank you. Um, please keep your responses at about three minutes. I'm going to give the audience a quick reminder that you can begin submitting your questions in the Q&A box. If your question is directed at one of our panelists in particular, please indicate that in your question. You can also raise your hand and you'll be recognized to give your question. To the panelists, please don't answer or address any question asked in the Q&A box until I read it out loud so people don't get disoriented. Um, so we'll do responses and feel free to address those or not to address those. And we'll do also do the responses in the order that you spoke. So Andrew, if you could go first, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, so I think just to respond generally to the point, I think of DSA being a professional managerial class membership or being a careerist membership, I, I, I think is broad, it's definitely broadly true that it is something that we in DSA need to recognize and work on. I think actually our recruitment drive recently actually did some stuff with relational organizing to build a slightly more working class organization, although that's a project that will continue. Um, but but I do think this characterization of this as if careerism is like broadly run by liberals or uh, careerists or the PMC is like well over exaggerated than what it is. I strongly disagree with DSA's approach nationally to uh, Biden in the general election. I, I I actually think it was like a tragic mistake. But to, to act of it as, as if that's a major affection on DSA's program, DSA's membership, I think is after the absurd and um, somewhat unjustified. Uh, and, and I think just to point out on our politics, I think we can see DSA chapters across the country really working to build a class struggle and class political struggle, even, even if it's less apparent on the national level, whether that be tax the rich campaigns, uh, supporting unions and strikes like many chapters have, um, so on and so forth. Um, I'm also just gonna spend a quick second, I think responding to characterization of electing socialist leaders as kind of socialism from above, which I broadly think is a wrong-headed strategy. I mean, and I think it's, electing socialism is, I think, a reflection of growing worker, working power and working class power. Um, we as socialists, I think, want to change our society and exercise power to reject um, illegitimate power and the ruling class. So, Working to re rejecting electoral politics or state power as a means of expressing that power uh, leaves us isolated and out of power. Um, I mean, and that does have to be tied in, obviously, with this actual movement building and worker self actualization. But the movement can't fully reject electoral strategy as socialism from above, in my mind. So, yeah. Okay, now we'll go to Jack. Yeah, just a couple of very quick points. On electoral politics, uh, it's not all Bernie and it's not even all AOC. There's a really good piece recently that uh, Peter Dreyer just had, I think, in uh, Talking Points Memo. And uh, he took a look at the number of down ballot races where socialists have uh, won. And it looks to him and it looks to me like it's we're approaching we're not at the Debsian level of thousands and thousands of local officials, but we're at the position of hundreds. And that makes a difference in terms of having a voice in uh, the political discussion. Uh, second point, uh, I think DSA is a predominantly middle-class organization. Uh, I think that historically socialists have twisted themselves in pretzels sometimes about being feeling guilty about that. I don't think that makes sense. And I think you change the composition, you change what you're doing by what you do. Uh, and some of that, and I'll get into positions I think are gonna be a little bit more controversial here. I think some of that is having relationships with the institutional labor movement. 
I am all for socialism from below. I've been a member of the Association for Union Democracy for decades. Uh, I believe that workers need to control their own unions. And I believe that people who are elected by their fellow workers to head unions have some legitimacy until they don't. Uh, and that you work with the institutional labor movement. And that's, that's, part of, that's part of how you change uh, the way things happen. An even more controversial point I'll make is I think historically, if you take a look at the way in US politics, we have moved ahead, there is both tension and um, common ground between liberals and uh, socialists. And uh, it's a complex topic. But I don't regard liberals as the enemy. I, I, I regard us as working in some kind of continuity. Uh, and I, in terms of being willing to take on um, a democratic uh, administration, I have some uh, scars to show on that. I was very involved in fighting hard against the Carter administration's right turn. And you know, we were entirely principled about that. So I'll stop there. OK, now we're going to go to Jamal. Sure, um, I'll try to be quick. So uh, with regard to the question of the DSA's uh, middle class um, composition, um, I, I think there's a distinction to be made between the middle class composition of the membership, which is unfortunate, but you know, not something to freak out about, and the directly uh, careerist composition of much of the leadership. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that if you go to a major city DSA chapter, look at the members of the steering committee and just tick off all the ones who work in political campaigns, who work at NGOs, who are graduate students. The other day, someone was criticizing Class Unity on Twitter, and I looked her up. She, she was a literal McKinsey consultant, all right? So these people are everywhere in the DSA's leadership stratum, and we need to be cognizant of that fact and think about what that is doing to the politics of the organization when you have people whose livelihoods depend on budding up to the Democratic, uh, you know, party hierarchy. Um, with regard to... Um, uh, the fact that we've elected a lot of uh, nominally socialist politicians, you know, that's great. But as we're seeing in Chicago with uh, Andre Vasquez's recent vote, Larry Lightfoot's austerity budget, um, without the ability to discipline these candidates, it's not entirely clear what that's going to amount to in the end. Um, if you take a look at what Shama Sawant has been able to do in She's elected by Socialist Alternative, um, and Socialist Alternative controls everything about what she does. They control her votes. They control her staffing. Um, she surrenders a significant proportion of her salary to the organization. Um, she's, she's held to uh, a, a level of party discipline that the DSA does not hold its electeds to, and that's something that we need to be thinking very seriously about how to replicate because it doesn't really do us any good if we're electing a bunch of socialists and then half of them turn around and start cutting deals you know with pelosi or Lori lightfoot or, or whoever um and uh i think lance's points with regard to uh the dsa sort of uh you know flirtation with biden are entirely correct and for the record class unity did publish uh, an editorial saying that the dsa leadership needs to shut up about supporting joe biden um but i would disagree with um his suggestion that we need to be uh somehow tailing black lives matter um black lives matter itself was a distraction for the left um, from the overwhelming um, economic crisis that is hitting the entire working class right now. Yes, maybe some police killings were the straw that broke the camel's back, but as we're seeing from the back of Black Lives Matter is gone now. Um, that's not actually what the working class needed to be mobilized in a coherent and a durable fashion. Um, so the left needs to be very careful about tailing whatever social or whatever protest wave kind of pops up. Um, and taking our eye off the ball of the brute economic factors that the, the bulk of the working class is actually concerned with. Um, we should be talking a lot more about where the hell the stimulus checks are, um, you know, why the government hasn't been paying people's wages, um, then we should be talking about Black Lives Matter at this, at this moment. Um, with that, I think I'm done. All right, now Lance. Yeah, I think that uh, a lot of comrades have made have made points that um, you know I, are in line with the, with some of the things that I said and some of the criticisms of DSA from members themselves seem, seem pretty harsh in in a way that uh, I would feel a little reticent to offer, even though I might agree with them. Uh, and so I think that that's an important uh, thing to say. I think that again, what I tried to emphasize was that because uh, um, 
is I've had a number of debates with people about um, the uh, characterization of the DSA, and I certainly believe that there are all sorts of members of, you know, rank and file members of the DSA who um, are every bit as um, interested in, um, you know, fighting to change the system as anyone. Um, but I think uh, the, the, the overall trajectory and struggle structure of the organization actually prioritizes the electoral um, struggle, uh, the electoral uh, campaigns. And, and I think partly because of the, the leadership questions that, that people have raised. Um, even, the, even the caucuses, and I'm, I'll put class unity aside on this one, but even the, the main caucuses such as the, the, the Jacobin and so forth, uh, the Bread and Roses, um, in my mind actually put together, uh, come up with a lot of Marxist sounding justifications for what is you know, mostly reformist social democratic electoral politics. So I think that any talk about actually a real transformational socialism is actually gonna have to Break with that, and 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 um, um, and and actually orient itself on on socialism from below. The other thing I will say, and I will disagree with the question about Black Lives Matter. Um, we could have debates about you know the characterization uh, of Black Lives Matter, but I think the to me the argument about not being focused on electoralism, the answer on the other hand is not just su supporting so-called universal demands but not being involved with the struggle from below. The struggle from below presents itself in many different ways and socialists have to actually be able to be active and agile and, and work within it. Now, racism is the biggest divide in the American working class. And you can't get around that fact by just saying that we're for Medicare for all instead. You actually have to take a, a principled stand on racism. Uh, and as CLR James has written, you know that the, when the black working class moves, it shifts and, and can shake the entire American working class. The other thing I would say, of course, is that you know the working class isn't just white and male. It's actually majority uh, people of color, women, uh, and so on. And so the, the sort of having an, a notion that, that separates race and class or separates gender and, and class, I think is, is the, wrong, the wrong way to go. Um, so I think that's, that's where how a socialist movement is gonna be able to build itself, I think, based on having those kind of understandings and being at the forefront of the fights against oppression and exploitation. So there's been this underlying kind of like arc of people imploring like history. Andrew, I was wondering if you would respond to both Jack and Lance and Jamal to an extent um, regarding this kind of historical task of socialism that seems to be underlying the DSA and how that actually relates to the present, if at all. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it relates to the present in, 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 in the same way that that um, it wasn't DSA's task before. And I, I don't think DSA's task at its founding wasn't necessarily as a socialist a task as it is right now. Um, and I think Jamal may have spoken about this at his original speech, which we've seen DSA members pretty much replace um, what was the DSA membership before in power, except for some outlying caucuses and membership. Um, and, and I think what we've seen with that is DSA adopt, starting to adopt at least a program um, that is actually socialist. I mean, you can see some of the questions um, in, in the Q&A thing, where, where I think we can actually see them. Um, class struggle start, starting to emerge out of the DSA and class politics aren't to emerge in advance sense on that. I mean, just to, I think, relate this into the Black Lives Matter uprising that people have been talking about a bit um, is there's ultimately a middle ground that I think we have seen DSA in some chapters very well adopt this working class struggle um, and move it from what could be an identitarian struggle in some met, met way into a more class-based analysis um, that I think has actually been super successful as a part of DSA's socialist task today. Um, I was wondering if you, plus also any, anyone else who wants to respond to this question, kind of want to define what class struggle means for the DSA specifically. It's been underlined that um, to, greater to greater or lesser degrees of affirmation that the DSA has a like largely middle Middle class like population in it. I was wondering, like, both what is class struggle to the DSA, and also what is its um. Actually, yeah, let's just go with that. So the question is, what is class struggle to the DSA? Okay. 
Um, yeah, I'd like to bring up something that Jack said about there not being a discontinuity between socialism and liberalism. Um, and I think that is, in fact, one of the things that makes it difficult for the left to reach the working class, because um, the working class, and I'm talking about the multiracial working class here, you know, white, black, Hispanic, man, woman, what, whatever, by and large, um, hates liberals. Um, and this is something that socialists and the American left, which emerges by and large out of the left wing of, of the liberal Democratic Party, um, this is a serious impediment for us. Because when we go out into, you know, uh, culturally conservative parts of the country, um, and people ask, like, like they asked Bernie questions about gun, gun rights, and Bernie basically flip flopped to adopt the cultural liberal stance of the Democratic Party in which he was running, that's a serious problem. We need to be able to go out and say we're here to fight for the economic interests of the working class. This cultural stuff, you know, pe reasonable people can disagree. You know, if, if you want to support gun rights and this other person over here opposes gun rights, whatever, that's peripheral to, the, to what we're fighting for. Um, and I think that the refusal to consider, um, you know, that sort of big tent you know, cultural politics, where you can have people who disagree on these issues and still be part of the left and still be fighting um, for the same baseline economic concerns. Um, the, the fact that the left won't do that, I think, is fundamentally crippling to our ability to reach a working class constituency. And it's something that we need to reconsider very strongly. Jack, would you like to respond uh, regarding that on kind of like the meaning of liberalism there in that scenario? Well, I think liberalism means a lot of things. It's uh, it's a very confusing tradition, and the fact that neoliberalism labels itself labels itself and has been labeled by others as neoliberalism, referring to a totally laissez-faire um, set of arrangements in the economy, adds to the confusion. But in the American context, liberalism has always meant a reform tradition uh, and a, an openness to um, change and an openness to doing things differently. Uh, the, again, the institutional labor movement is in its political orientation liberal. And it's liberal in ways that are better than it used to be. Uh, on you know, the, the FLCIO at this point is officially uh, pro-gay rights, which to put it mildly was not the George Meany FLCIO. The official uh, American labor movement is uh, very consciously uh, anti-racist at this point, which was not always true of the American American unions. Uh, but th those really are uh, elements that have that they've come out of real struggles, but they haven't been pri primarily socialist struggles. They've been struggles of lots of well-meaning people with really liberal, small L liberal in the best intentions, trying to open up the society and give more room to people. And I think that that's not I agree with Jamal, that's not our main struggle, but it is, it's a good thing. Lance, I was wondering if you also wanted to give an input on kind of the meaning of liber liberalism to socialists from your perspective. Well, um, one of the things that was always said is that Karl Marx was originally liberal, that the first thing he wrote was a, uh, a you know, a, a defense of free speech, but he broke with that because he saw the limitations of liberalism and its accommodation to the system. And I think that, you know, Jack's, um, the history that he tells, uh, you know, a lot of what ended up happening at that point was the fact that um, the liberal uh, Democratic, you know, the liberal, the liberals were in power in the Democratic Party. The liberals also included people like, um, uh, What's the name? Scoop Jackson, who uh, Henry Jackson, who was the senator from Boeing, you know, he was a, a New Deal liberal, died, died in war, but a hardcore hawk on the Vietnam War uh, and actually was the, the person that a lot of the people that ended up forming Social Democrat USA ended up backing for um, pre presidency, I think, in 76. So in other words, uh, one of the reasons Martin Luther King had to break from uh, the mainstream of the Democratic Party on the Vietnam War is because the mainstream of liberalism was in favor of the of the um, uh, the Vietnam War, so I think that what we're going to see in going forward is that I think um, today you have um, uh, the um, an attempt by I think the people in the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, which also includes the 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 members of the DSA and the Squad and so on, trying to figure out a way to work with. 
the Bidens of the world, where the Bidens of the world are really the people who kind of run the show. Unfortunately, at election time, the um, the progressives and now the de- some of the democratic socialists are the people who hold their tongues, you know, be, you know, stand for unity, get you know, mobilize people to vote, for and put these people in power. And liberalism, maybe more liberal in terms of racial, ethnic, and and so forth, questions now than it was twenty or thirty years ago. But um, at the same time. Uh, you, you're you're going to see very little in terms of um, uh, progress for uh, either on economic questions or actually in, in a large scale on, on on racial justice questions either. Remember, Biden was not in favor of defunding the police. So um, uh, and so I think that that's one of the that's one of the contradictions that I think that which is why as a socialist all my life I've never been in favor of supporting any any democratic politician or any socialist who runs on the democratic party line because it's always a compromise with the people with the democratic party which is one of the two ruling capitalist parties in the country bouncing up bouncing off that there's a question in the chat we're not going to quite get to the questions just yet but there's a question that i think is like relevant to this conversation is how would the panelists define a socialist politician? What exactly does that mean to each of you? Um, let's just go in like the normal. Actually, no, Jamal, you look like you want to speak. Let's go. Yeah, through I, first. So I think that um, the DSA at the moment um, sort of believes that a politician is someone is a politician who is a socialist in their heart and who genuinely believes in socialism. And, you know, that's better than nothing, but that's not, that can't really get you that far. Um, historically, if you look at successful socialist and yeah, social democratic parties, you know, in the heyday of social democracy, even if you look at how these parties discipline their politicians, um, a socialist politician is one who is under the discipline of a socialist organization. That's the only answer. And if that politician runs on a democratic ballot line or Republican ballot line, or a third party ballot line, whatever, you know, that's a separate question. But um, if we in the DSA want to have socialist politicians, they need to be accountable to us and we need to devise mechanisms to hold them accountable to us as Socialist Alternative does in Seattle. Um, and I, I think that's that's really the key thing that a lot of people in DSA don't want to talk about because it upsets the sort of political operative gravy train that the leadership is riding. Andrew, would you, would you like to respond to that question? Or Jack, you look like you want to as well. Yeah, so uh, I turn that question around. AOC is, I think, by anybody's definition, a socialist politician. I mean, she is one of the- I don't more... know about that. Okay, she's been about as outspoken as anybody in it, identifying herself as a democratic socialist. I would argue in the 2020 campaign, her energetic endorsement of Bernie made a crucial difference in terms of Bernie having some real legs in that campaign, including uh, support in the Hispanic community. So AOC is, and and there are some people in the DSA leadership who early on went to AOC and said, you have to be accountable to us. Uh, AOC quite properly said, I have to be accountable to the people who elected me, my constituents. I represent my constituents in Congress. And in any in the vital social democratic parties that existed uh, in the heyday, as, as you said, in the heyday of social democracy, there was a little bit less of a conflict on that kind of thing because the German social democratic party and the uh, the voting population that put the deputies into the, uh, into the uh, German uh, parliament were uh, more or less the same people. But it's, it's really a formulation where a fairly middle-class strata of DSA members who are very politically conscious and read and study a lot and are willing to be very verbally combative, uh, place themselves above a poor and working class community and say, you're answerable to us, not them. I, I don't think that works even in basic democratic theory. I, I think it works in Seattle, though. If you look at Shama Sawant and what she's been able to accomplish there, uh, passing the Amazon head, head tax, basically reorienting city council, um, you know, entirely around, you know, her messaging and her campaigns. Um, she's able to do that because she's her feet are held to the fire by a disciplined political organization that doesn't let her get off the hook. You know, AOC can be accountable to her constituents. And what does that mean in practice? In practice, that seems to mean AOC is accountable to Nancy Pelosi. 
right? So I, I think we need to be very clear about when when Ask we Nancy allow Pelosi about that. <laughs> well, I mean, we'll see. Do you think AOC is going to vote for her? The answer is probably yes, right? AOC is going to vote for Nancy Pelosi to be Speaker of the House. So yes, I, I think that it's a it's a you know this is a serious problem here because if if the Socialist Party is not holding our politicians to account, yeah, they can say, oh, I'm listening to my constituents, I'm listening to my constituents, but we all know what that means in practice in the United States in Congress. It means you're listening to donors. It means you're listening to you know the the party brass basically. So I, I think that that would be my response to that. So Jack and Jamal, there seems to be something kind of underlying throughout what both of you are saying in a certain way. So Jamal, you're saying that politicians, the DSA help get elected, need to, there needs to be some mechanism of accountability. And I don't think it's any coincidence, Jack, that you also brought up AOC because as you pointed out, the DSA um, said to AOC when they were trying to get her elected that you need to be accountable to us. And she said, no. Um, it seems Jamal that you are kind of pointing to like the necessity of some party uh, to exist. Is the DSA capable of being that? In its present state, certainly no. But I think that the DSA needs to be at least attempting to lay the groundwork for something like that to emerge. And whether the DSA will be the major constituent part of that party in the future or not, I don't know. I don't think we can predict that. But um, I think that the, the question of the party is essential. We cannot, you know, use the Democratic or the Republican Party and, and hope to achieve anything substantial over the long term. Now, over the short term, you know, I disagree with Lance when he categorically rules out ever running on the Democratic ballot line. I think for pragmatism's sake, you have to do that sometimes. That doesn't mean that it's optimal. And it also doesn't mean that you, you shouldn't insist on other um, mechanisms to hold uh, politicians to account. Um, the party surrogate model that uh, Dustin Guasola and Jared Abbott, uh, you know, laid out in that, that uh, Catalyst article, which I'm sure many people in the audience have read, I think is a good starting point for this. Um, we need to be creating a membership organization that is capable of disciplining uh, politicians that run on whatever ballot line, be that Democratic, be that Republican, be that Socialist, be that Green, whatever. Um, yeah. But a party is absolutely essential. A party for the working class is essential. And, and I think, I, I mean, just to add in here, the, there is, uh, discipline does happen. Like Andre Vasquez, who was elected in Chicago by DSA, uh, was expelled from DSA membership because he voted for Lori Lightfoot's austerity budget. Like that did happen. And there's a reason that happened. And, and, and to say that it doesn't exist in especially our larger chapters, we can see DSA is the people electing these people. Like these people will not be elected without DSA knocking every door in their district. Well, I, I think the, the case of Andre is interesting because Andre didn't need DSA. And I think that's one of the reasons why Andre was so willing to buck Chicago DSA, because fundamentally Chicago DSA endorsed a different candidate in the first round, um, didn't actually provide enough door knocking to constitute his margin of victory in the second round. So he felt that, you know, he didn't need DSA. Um, I, I think that DSA's other politicians in Chicago, a lot of them, you're absolutely correct that without DSA, they wouldn't have been elected. But the connection between that fact and actual accountability is kind of fuzzy. And we have to ask ourselves, is expelling Andre from the DSA, does that actually matter to him? I mean, does, why should he care in the long run? If he wants to reorient himself as a kind of like center left progressive Chicago politician, um, he doesn't have any reason to care about this. So I think this is why, you know, when, when we're thinking about who we endorse and how we go about sort of building political capacity that is not just able to get politicians elected, but that can actually scare them, right, over the course of their entire, um, you know, uh, uh, term in office, you know, that's really where we need to be, where we need to be bring adopting you know, structures and procedures that are already in place in Socialist Alternative. We can look at them and see how they're doing this in the United States right now um, with Kshama Sawant, who, again, you know, I'll, I'll point this out. Kshama Sawant surrenders like, I don't know, a third of her salary. Um, she is paid the average salary of a professional worker in her district. Um, imagine Imagine a DSA candidate. Imagine AOC surrendering, you know, $75,000 a year to not just the DSA, but to, you know, unions in her district that helped get her elected and what have you. That's far-fetched, but that's the kind of thing that we really need to be focusing on. I mean, I think there's, there's also a reason, though, Socialist Alternative has one elected official in the entire United States. 
It's because they had a nationwide organization in 2013 that was able to directly tie itself to the $15 minimum wage project and then have one elected official representing their entire organization. I mean, that's great for them, but that's, that works on a very limited approach in huge democratic cities in nonpartisan elections. And, and then because of that, that elects a very small working class base and cannot work on the mass scale that I think DSA is trying to get to. And, 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 I, and I agree with you that there needs to be more official, like in our bylaws, accountability measures. Yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right that social alternative has a cap on its growth. I think you're absolutely right about that. I think that we can't learn everything from social alternative, but there are things that we can learn. And I think this is one of them. So Lance, I was you were earlier on you implored like kind of your historical tradition that you seem to follow. Um, you implore like Lenin, Luxembourg, Trotsky, Gramsci. Um, I was wondering, does this kind of problem of does this problem of internal organization within the DSA seem to kind of ring, ring in any way to the past, to this historical tradition? How would this be transformed? Maybe that's a poor phrasing, but. Well, I guess it's a longer, a longer discussion. Um, I mean, the one thing I was going to say about just this current discussion about holding politicians accountable, what a socialist politician is. I mean, you can go back and read, uh, you know, August Nymph's book on on Lenin's um, uh, uh, the electoral, electoral um, strategy, uh, the Bolsheviks and the Tsarist Duma, you know, in which the in which the parliamentary representative were thought to be basically activists who were there to kind of stir the pot and to proclaim for socialism, not necessarily to, um, and, and most of them would never vote for a budget, would never vote for a, a war budget, which by the way, AOC has one, <laughs> voted for, um, uh, you know, a defense budget um, and, um, and, and so forth. So they were there to actually kind of as activists and socialists in parliament as, as sort of proclaiming from parliament. Um, so, uh, uh, but that was also about connected to a particular organization. And I think the, the kind of idea of an organization is not one that splits, that has a kind of specialization between politics and economics that has, as the old social democratic parties do. And as I think a lot of people in today and kind of the, what the, the, the kind of neo-Katskians in DSA would like to have is that there's trade union specialists, there's electoral specialists, and that maybe we get together and talk about socialism on May Day. But the the real, uh, the, kind of the, the socialist tradition I'm sort of more familiar with, the Leninist tradition, actually has um, a view in which the, the two things are, are, are interlocked. And that I believe that, um, and that the important thing coming from the common turn is that the, um, the electoral struggle is always subordinate to the class struggle, uh, and the and the and the class struggle also has a broader, uh, you know, a, a broad a purview. It's not just workers in the factories. It could also be um, uh, workers in the fields. It could also be uh, fighting on on on, uh, on uh, anti-racist demands as well. And so, the important thing is that if you're going to talk about if we're going to talk about accountability for politicians, it's really as 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 Jamal said, I mean, what does Andre Vasquez care about the DSA? He probably helped it helped his resume enough to get to where he is. And he's probably, I think he was always an Elizabeth Warren Democrat anyway. But I think he's going, you know, he may or may not really care that much about DSA and may actually walk around proclaiming that he's glad that he's, you know, that they left him, he didn't leave them, whatever. But the point is that um, the, um, that, um, that you can only really talk about real accountability and what politicians are accountable to if you have actual a strong organization that has a fundamental agreement on what it's fighting for that actually puts the parliamentary struggle secondary to what it to what its role is and and has a, a, a har, an ideological anti-capitalist point of view that it's that it's um, pr proposing um, i mean socialist alternative maybe does that on, on a certain level um, but um, uh, you know for us to talk about socialism in the US as a whole, it, it has to be on a much bigger and higher level uh, than that. Okay, so I think we're gonna, thank you, Lance. I think we're gonna try to pivot to the Q&A here. Um, where am I at? So if you have, I put it in the chat, but if you have asked a question in the Q&A and it's been approved, feel free to raise your hand and you can say it out loud. If you don't wanna say it out loud, I can just read it for you. 
I think the first person we're going to go to is Ed, um, because, yeah, I believe he was the first to ask a question. Yes, thank you. Um, so, so this question is really motivated by the fact that I, I felt like I only really understood the DSA in its kind of structural form when I read Jack Ross's uh, History of the Socialist Party of America, which treats uh, some of the Meanite, Shackmanite versus McGovernite, uh, Shackmanite history that um, was, was discussed on the panel. Um, so the question is, I'll, I'll read it as I wrote it. DSA's predecessor, DSOC, emerged in the aftermath of the 1972 presidential campaign of George McGovern. So I'm curious to hear the panelists reflect on the significance of McGovern and McGovernism in transforming the Democratic Party and thus the American left, which has essentially remained an adjunct of the Democratic Party in our lifetimes. Um, do you see Sanders as a McGovernite candidate, candidate, for example? There seem to be parallels because just as McGovern initially drew support from anti-establishment working class supporters of George Wallace, but eventually uh, centered on the college educated constituency in 1972. Sanders initially in 2000, in 2015, uh, drew support from anti-establishment working class Trump supporters, people who would become Trump supporters, but eventually uh, Sanders and his campaign centered on the contemporary PMC constituency. Um, so were the potentials and limitations of, of the Sanders campaign essentially those of the McGovern campaign? And is McGovernism the ultimate political horizon of the American left in our lifetime? So I'm, I'm curious to hear actually what each of the panelists have to say on that, because I think you all will have, have something. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, whoever would like to respond. Uh, sure, I can go first. Um, I think that's an interesting parallel. I think that you're right to point out that Sanders 2016, in terms of his electoral constituency, like, electoral constituency looks very different from Sanders 2020. Um, whether or not that indicate some sort of McGovernite horizon. I don't really know. I don't, I don't really care about that. But um, I do think it's important for us on the left to look at that constituency that the Sanders campaign basically lost or hemorrhaged between 2016 and 2020 and recognize that for what it is. That is a constituency that we need to know how to appeal to. We need to know how to reach if we want to build a working class American left. And whether that's the DSA or some other organization. Um, and it's important once again to underline, I think that that constituency, um, you know, it, it's not just rural whites, right? Um, Sanders, you know, there, there is this tremendous nexus of working class Sanders support um, kind of defecting to Trump. In 2016, a lot of them were, were working class whites, but in 2020, we saw a lot of, you know, Hispanics, you know, migrating to Trump in, in the general election, um, to a lesser extent, African Americans as well. So, um, you know, this is just a plain old working class constituency. The left needs to know how to talk to it. The left needs to prioritize communicating to it um, because the, the liberals have a lockdown on the PMC. We're not gonna be able to compete nor should we want to compete with the progressive wing of the Democratic Party for the affections of the of you know college graduates. Um, the working class is out there. No one's talking to them. No one's representing them. It's time for us to do that. Okay. I'm gonna jump in on this a little bit and say, first of all, if McGovernism is our far horizon, we're in trouble, because remember, George McGovern got 37% of the vote. That's, um, you can't, no matter where we're going, you can't get the kind of social transformation that we're looking for if you are stuck in a minority position. That said, George McGovern was in many ways a very inspiring figure. Uh, he really galvanized um, the anti-war movement in a, in a really exciting way in the 1972 election. Uh, that anti-war movement was not primarily uh, blue collar workers by any means. Uh, it was a, uh, a mostly college educated middle class constituency. And I would point out that about a third of the American population consists of college educated uh, people. Uh, and a fair number of them are in jobs like teachers. I mean, you can't just say that we're not, we, you know, we're, we're for the working class. We don't care about college educated people. The class structure of the United States is a little bit more complex than that. And you need, you need to be working on it. Um, I wanna get back to some of the issues about holding people accountable and party and all that kind of thing. DSA is an exciting organization. It's grown tremendously and it's tiny in the scope of the American political scene. Uh, the idea that DSA 
and I think the, the, fundamentally the idea that you're going to function like socialist alternative is a sectarian notion. Uh, the way you're going to hold people accountable is by acting in coalition with broader forces who really do have the power to hold people accountable. It's going to be a long time before DSA has that kind of clout. But if the unions start rebuilding themselves, if you're working with uh, organized feminist organizations, if you're working with uh, uh, the Black, Black Lives uh, Matter, the coming together of those forces really can hold people accountable. But DSA itself, is, it's a long time before uh, an organized socialist organization is going to have that kind of clout to really hold people accountable. No one else wants to respond. I think I'm going to do this question in the Q&A from David Faze, because I feel like it's kind of been underlying a lot of the conversation in a way. So David's question is, Eugene Debs once said that the Republican Party represents the capitalist class, the Democratic Party, the middle class, and the Socialist Party, the working class. There are claims on the panel that supposed socialists running as Democrats have won many, many down ballot elections, and the growth of the DSA represents the growth of working class power. It's unclear to me what ideological, dis ideologically distinguished DSA sponsored candidates, what I, I'm sorry, what ideologically distinguishes DSA sponsored candidates from progressive Democrats. By this, I mean New Deal welfare liberals. Historically, the mass socialist parties of the Second International didn't have to have, did not, did not have, did not have to have a positive policy program but was solely oppositional, claiming to politically represent a working class organized independently from the state and civil society in unions, cooperatives, associations, educational initiatives, health services, tenant unions, et cetera, with the goal of taking state power internationally. Coming back around to it, if DSA is more than building support for left Democrats, how will it become more? I can start to attack that and I, I think there's an element of it that I think is like the sad truth of it is that like DSA has elected some quote unquote New Deal welfare liberals. Um, but, but ultimately what should distinguish a DSA sponsored uh, candidate is the primacy of class and a really rigid class analysis and, and how they look upon society and what their goal is um, when they enter into office. Um, and, and then looking at kind of the second part of the question, um, if DSA is becoming more to build support for left Democrats. What ultimately must change is that we have to work internally, I think, to have a political education um, that, 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 that builds up a stronger class analysis within DSA membership. Um, ultimately, I think we can see that a lot of DSA members are new to socialism as a whole uh, and new, new to Marxism and anything of that sort. So, so ultimately, I think that does come to be like the step of building a working class socialist uh, membership that, that, that will therefore nominate actual socialist working class uh, leaders um, when we do electoral work. I guess, you know, one thing I just want to say about this is that, again, all of this is really, um, all, all of the, the possibilities that people are talking about is really predicated on what actually the existing balance of class forces is, what the level of um, of mobilization of the of the working class and the social movements is, and right now, especially in the in the face of the pandemic, um, the uh, that mobilization is not where it needs to be in order for us to actually even talk about um, you know transforming um, society. So. Um, it's only in that process where we would actually build up the strength of those organizations and, and probably form new organizations over the ones that, that exist now that you can even talk about, I think, a socialist organization having the kind of social weight and power that would hold politicians accountable and would also um, advance a program that is um, you know, transformative and, and, and anti-capitalist. Um, and I think one of the, one of the traps of you know, running on the Democratic ballot line, uh, especially in the absence of, of that more stronger um, um, sort of social movement backing, is that one, the politician and the success of the electoral campaign sort of then um, kind of is put up and comes in, come, um, substitutes for, substitutes for 
the social mobilization that's necessary. Uh, and a lot of energy is put into that. Um, and um, I think the other thing too, is that if you run on the democratic ballot line and you're, you have quote success, then, then the idea that you're gonna somehow the next time around say, oh, sorry, I'm an independent socialist and leave the democratic ballot line. Uh, when you think that you're being on the democratic ballot line is probably the reason you got elected or at least got a hearing. I think there's a contradiction there, which I think means that the people that are in favor of the dirty break, and even Guastella, who talks about you know decades for uh, before the um, uh, the kind of party surrogate thing, generates what he's what he's for, um, means that there's a lot of time where um, you know we we don't have the time right uh, of decades and decades uh, with um, uh, working with Democrats throughout throughout that whole time. It just becomes, you know, the goal of an independent socialist party or the independent socialist organization becomes something that gets keeps getting postponed and postponed into the future. Jamal, you want to go? Oh, Jamal might be frozen. Oh, wait, there he goes. Hey, yeah. um, I, sorry, I, I think I dropped off, but I, I think Lance made an excellent point. If you don't mind me jumping in, I'll, I'll just uh, make a very brief comment. Um, you're absolutely correct that um, a lot of people in the DSA who talk about eventually seceding from the Democratic Party um, don't actually have any sort of idea about when that might occur. Um, I think that's because no one wants to talk about the elephant in the room, which is electoral reform. The reason we have to use the Democratic ballot line is because of first past the post. That's it. That's as simple as it is. Right. If we lived in Sweden, we wouldn't be running on the Social Democrats ballot line or the Liberal Party's ballot line. Um, but the left doesn't like to grapple with electoral reform because it's something that you can actually go out there and you actually organize around change. Um, it's not purely theoretical. Um, in Maine and Alaska right now, we can run third party candidates under ranked choice voting and make a serious you know, play for winning seats. Um, in a lot of states, you can pass ranked choice voting via ballot initiative. It'll take some work um, and yeah, it won't happen overnight, but it's a much uh, shorter, uh, you know, sort of uh, time horizon um, than, you know, sort of trying to uh, hibernate in the Democratic Party for decades and decades and then emerge, you know, as some kind of xenomorph or something. So I, I think that's a, a key point that a lot of people don't like to talk about that we need to be talking about more is that electoral reform is, is a necessary precondition of third party politics if we actually want to win seats. Jack, I was wondering if you wanted to address this question. If not, that's okay too. That's okay. Uh, yeah, I, I favor working in the Democratic Party because I think that's where most of the people we want to work with are. I also, uh, agree, although Jamal and I disagree strongly on that, Lance and I disagree strongly on that, uh, I absolutely agree that ranked choice voting would be a major improvement in the American electoral system. Uh, it's not gonna happen overnight uh, and there'll be a lot of bumps along the road. To Lance's point about we don't have time to work with the Democrats, um, this is a very old argument in the socialist movement uh, and the idea that we don't have time to work with liberals and Democrats, but somehow we do have time for uh, a revolutionary socialist party to somehow take take power uh, just strikes me as illusory. I mean, we have to work with the conditions we have right now uh, on things like climate change, on things like uh, um, reform of the, the police and uh, the uh, among the elected officials taking power right now, not all of them socialist by any means, but the major efforts to get district attorneys elected, for example, uh, have happened in ordinary democratic politics. And it's, it matters. Uh, and it's, we're not gonna be, we're not gonna be able to, if we don't have time to work with liberal people to our right to get things done, uh, but we do have time to uh, create the uh, mass socialist party that's gonna solve all the problems. I just don't see how that timeline works. Okay, if we'd like, we can go on to another question unless anyone wants to respond to one another. Okay, so this next question is from Diaz. Um, for all panelists, can we take it for granted that those drawn to the DSA through the Bernie campaign are interested in socialism, given that what socialism means to Sanders is really New Deal liberalism or so-called progressive capitalism? 
Are universal demands, for example, Medicare for all, a step towards socialism or a step away from it? Universal demands uh, like Medicare for all are a step towards socialism. Um, you know, the fact that in the United States people uh, have health insurance that's tied to employment means that employers have a tremendous amount of leverage uh, to union bust by basically threatening people's lives, you know, if they go on strike. Um, uh, I, to me, that's just an obvious point. So, so I, I don't think we really need to entertain the notion that Medicare for all is not a step towards socialism. Um, I agree that plenty of people, you know, who joined DSA um, in the aftermath of Sanders' campaign are politically naive and, you know, not particularly, you know, quote unquote socialist or, or Marxist orientation. You know, whatever. That's you know, welcome to the real world. That's the working class. You've got to learn how to educate these people and, um, you know, introduce them to Marxist and class politics. Um, the fact that the DSA has lots of kind of normal people who aren't particularly politically engaged is a good thing. And any mass, you know, working class party that we could ever hope to found is going to face the same problem. Lance, I was wondering if you wanted to respond to that one. Yeah, uh, you know, largely agree with um, that characterization. I, you know, I'm not, I, I work with people in the DSA all the time and uh, the, the 33rd Ward IPO and so on and the, and the work around Albany Park and um, Chicago. Um, but, uh, and so they're, you know, they're all good people. We all have, we have our debates and discussions and whatnot. But I think that as far as like uh, Sanders politics, uh, I think that, you know, mo mo most of the people that join, and I think most people on the panelists will, will agree that most people who joined out of the Sanders campaign um, probably were attracted to, they, they had a certain, there was a certain vocabulary to their sense of having grown up in the uh, period after the Great Recession and just the, you know, the, 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 the terrible economic conditions that people grew up in. Sanders gave them a sort of vocabulary about how to how to understand that. He called it socialism. He pretty much is a much more not much more than a, a New Deal Democrat. Uh, he probably would be on the right of most social part, social democratic parties in Britain or or, or Europe. But um, the uh, and so then I think a lot of people that 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 joined the DSA, you know, also reflect those politics. I'm not saying, and I'm sure there's a lot of people, uh, probably a minority. Uh, um, probably fewer than the 10% that come to, to the, the chapter meetings um, who are open to more radical ideas or at least in a more, want to pursue it in a more rad, um, organized way, more radical Marxist ideas. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people who read stuff all the time, you know, that just on their own about that, that are educating themselves as radicals and socialists and Marxists. But um, I think overall, my guess is that overall the membership the overall membership, the, the tens of thousands, um, are much more closer to progressive Democrats than they are to, to uh, or social Democrats than they are to revolutionary socialists. True, it's our job to try to convince people to draw different conclusions. Uh, and the, the work that of education around politics can only get you so far. It's really social change and what happens in society is really gonna be the kind of thing that really Will um, pose other questions that will be an that will have to be answered in terms of organization, relationship to the Democratic Party, race and class, oppression and exploitation, you know, the existent, you know, how the how 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 the working class should organize and with with and against the existing trade union leaders. You know, those are all questions that will have to be posed by, you know, real struggles in the future. I think something underlying Diaz's question, as well as David's question from earlier, um, where he implored Eugene Debs, it specifically the point that he says that um, the socialist parties of those times actually didn't go for positive policies. It was just stand, their whole position was standing against whatever uh, capitalist parties would present in Congress and such. Um, I think something underlying that when Diaz asks, are universal demands, for example, Medicare for all a step towards socialism or a step away from it, that if these demands were met, it would actually maybe foreclose the possibility of this struggle. Is it in a sense that when one is working for these universal demands, it's actually making it more and more difficult to work for this struggle in the future? Um, I, think, I think it's the opposite. It's hope radicalizes people defeat 
tends to make people feel like you, you can't fight City Hall, you can't get any place. Uh, now, obviously, there are examples where some kinds of reform slow people down and just say we don't need need as much. But there's lived historical experience right now, and this is you know Piketty 101, that the um, the tendency towards um, accumulation and monopolization and uh, the, the increasing uh, rich get richer dynamics in the society, uh, those were mitigated for a substantial period of time for more than a generation uh, by uh, a couple of world wars, a great depression, but primarily the rise of social movements and political movements that really made a difference. And I think it's, I, I love socialist history too. And I love taking a look at what you know, people were doing in terms of using parliament as a sounding board and everything else. But we should remember that the failure of a lot of those social democratic parties to actually enact real programs and to enact real reforms led to, led to the total collapse of societies, including in Germany. And, and all of us recite the uh, the problems of the uh, German Communist Party and you know, the, 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 the catechism of social fascism. But in fact, the social democrats proved themselves incapable of addressing the depression and proved themselves incapable of address addressing the um, deep dysfunction of 1920s Germany. And it was in part a heritage of we don't take responsibilities for anything. We don't have to really run the society. We're just an opposition force. And that, that's not where we want to be. Andrew, you look like you wanted to respond earlier. So. Yeah, I mean, I quite broadly agree with um, what Jack just said. I, I would like to take just a quick thing back to, to the first question. Um, and just saying like, when we engage in class struggle, of which DSA I think is really the, at least a major player, if not the only player, on the left doing this in any major way. Um, we, we are engaging like something that radicalizes our membership, like going on a tenant strike and like being, or he being shut off, like is an extremely radicalizing moment. Um, and like lends our membership towards, I think a radical politics. And I, I'd say there's a very, very, very small part of DSA membership that's not open to Marxism or radicalism. like the vast majority of people I think are it, they probably already identify as a radical and are already probably learning Marx at some sense of their DSA membership. Jamal, I was wondering if you were interested in responding to this. You mentioned earlier there wasn't enough Marxists in um, the DSA that are willing to actually engage, but there were a lot of anarchists and liberal careerist liberals. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that what's happened is that you've got a lot of, you know, politically unformed people join the DSA. Um, and who controls the political education committee by and large in major city chapters, it's sort of, you know, um, careerists and new leftists and no one really who's willing to say like, you know, uh, Marxism is class politics, basically. And so in major city chapters, you have this tremendous sort of vulnerability uh, to capture by uh, democratic NGO elements um, like Black Lives Matter, um, which leads the DSA into all sorts of bizarre, you know, political campaigns like defund the police, you know, which is something that nobody wants. That's not popular with any sector of the population, black, white, you know, whatever. This is this is political suicide and, and idiocy. Um, but the DSA, you know, is just so politically naive that it just kind of is blown hither and thither by the wind. Um, and if Marxists were in the organization, kind of, you know, attending political education meetings, speaking up at general meetings, you know, there's a question there that says, oh, if you if you oppose defunding the police, won't you be met by hostility? Well, yeah, you will. But that doesn't mean it's not worth it to stand up and, and fight for class politics. You might be met by hostility, but, but, but you might convince some people. And some people who go to the DSA, bounce off because they think it's politically bizarre, um, might be willing to say, oh, you know, these people seem all right. These people are talking about class politics. Maybe I'll hang out with them. Maybe I'll fight, fight, fight alongside them, right? So there's this idea that just because it's difficult 
you know, and it takes work to persuade the membership that class politics, you know, is distinct from just being the left wing of the democratic coalition. Um, that means that we may as well just give up and sort of wait around for some other formation to come along. Um, whatever formation comes along, is going to have the same goddamn problems, you know, uh, you, there's not going to be this perfect moment where you can just effortlessly um, enter some kind of, uh, you know, American left party and, and everyone will just accept Marxism um, as though it were handed down from heaven. You know, you've got to actually get your hands dirty. You got to fight for it. So um, yeah, that, that's the suggestion that I would give to anyone, you know, in the audience who thinks that the DSA is uh, kind of a, a liberal clusterfuck. It is, but um you know, there, there's not any alternative to actually doing the work and fighting. So I'd recommend that everyone, you know, buckle up and, and you know, sort of start attending meetings and get the lay of the land in their local chapters. Um, big city chapters are very different from local chat from, from smaller rural chapters as well. In smaller rural chapters, um, you know, there there is a lot of receptivity for a straightforward Marxist class struggle message that in big city chapters gets diluted by sort of obsession with tailing social movements and so forth. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend people, uh, you know, not not give up before they've they've taken a shake at it. I think we're going to go to we're going to go to Tom's question, then we're going to go to Lou's question because they kind of go hand in hand, uh, but with respect to different panelists. Um, so if Tom could be unmuted. Okay. Hi, um, I'm um, I'm someone who basically got his political training in the DSA of the 1980s, um, and the person that I actually the, the, the two people that I really got that training at the knee of were actually Jack Clark and somebody who's spoken at previous Palipus, uh, panels, Joe Schwartz. And there are a couple of, and I'm very interested in the contrast between the DSA of the 1980s um, and the DSA of today. Um, one thing that I think is, is very different is that um, I think that the, the class composition of certainly of, of young people within within the two DSAs is actually relatively similar, um, but I think that the difference that the, the, that there are real differences in 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 focus. Um, that I think that like we were very primarily um, saw a real link between um, the project of creating democratic left coalitions. Um, and socialist and and having a socialist identity, we saw the two things as being very very connected. Um, and I mean, there were big differences about whether you focused on the labor movement or whether you fa f focused on racial justice um, uh, movements around the Rainbow Coalition, for example, or, or feminists or gay and liberal liberation movements, or whatever. But what was common was this idea. That um, that our socialist identity was very much linked um, to the building of, um, of of broad democratic coalitions, and that seems to have disappeared um, and gone. And I, you know, I, was, I was interested in Jamal's sort of um, sort of critique that 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 that, um, that many DSA um, leaders seem to have positions. Um, in other in other movements and organizations, um, with that clearly being a bad thing, um, I think that 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 take reflects a real shift in perspective between the old 1980s DSA and and the current the current DSA. And um, I remember that um, in the old DSAU section, um, Michael Harrington always used to give us a sort of speech about how um, the relationship of middle class people to um, to socialism capitalism was going to was going to change. That my generation, um, there was sort of um, we weren't actually that frustrated by our own um, career opportunities and our own possibilities for social advancement. And I think that's really changed. I think that the prospects for um, young middle class people today are seriously worse than they were for young middle class people of my age. Um, and that's led to a very significant middle class con discontent uh, with capitalism which I think is actually um, quite important in terms of motivating um, many sectors of DSA membership. 
Um, and, you know, in Platypus, there's a lot of discussion about um, in the, the, the third estate in the, in the French Revolution um, and how that, in fact, if you look at the history of the revolution, sort of the, the instigation of agitation among the third estate, actually sort of a lot of it came from, um, from disgruntled members of the first estate, the, the, the nobility and also the um, second estate, the clergy. Um, and I'm wondering to what extent people feel that um, middle class discontent can be the basis. Tom, of what is? Could you so? Could you like summate those that question yep. though? Yeah, you know, I'm just gonna. Um, so the, well, the question is, uh, the two questions are one: um, is the relationship? Is there a relationship currently between um, forming democratic coalitions and socialist identity? Um, and secondly, um, can middle class discontent be the basis for viable class politics? Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and take first stab at it because I was mentioned. Um, I think with regard to uh, the first question, uh, you're right that there has, I think, been a shift in emphasis. Um, but I think that that shift in emphasis is due to a shift in the actual material arrangement of a lot of these social movement grassroots organizations. Um, they are now basically pipelines into the Democratic Party um, power structure uh, in major cities in particular. Um, this means that um, you know, it is naive, I think, to take a look at um, a quote unquote organization, you know, like Black Lives Matter and say, oh, this uh, organization speaks for some, uh, has an authentic connection to some actual constituency out there. Um, it doesn't really. Um, you know, there's popular anger that Black Lives Matter, the organization then comes in and claims to speak on behalf of. But in actuality, this is a way for people to launder themselves into, you know, sort of power brokers um, in, in local machine politics. So um, I, I think that that would, that underlies a lot of my suspicion um, of, uh, of careerists in the DSA orbit. Um, you know, people working for political campaigns and NGOs and so on and so forth, um, by and large, don't represent actual constituencies. They represent funders and donors and democratic politicians. Um, with regard to the second question, can middle class anger form the basis of uh, a class politics? I would say not, not of a working class politics. Um, you know, if, if our goal is uh, to mobilize the working class, um, properly speaking, and of course the the divide between working and middle class is fuzzy and so on and so forth. I, I think we all recognize that. But um, a middle class, an activated middle class that floods into socialist organizations will bring with it its own particular predilections and its own particular variety of politics that the working class doesn't really like. The working class doesn't like having to go and and sort of jump through all the 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 hoops that middle class activists like to you know put between you and part participation organization like the DSA. Um, you know I don't know how many you know sort of you know friends of mine have you know tried to go to the local DSA chapter and told me you know it was weird like I don't know why you know everyone you know has to recite their pronouns at the start of every meeting you know why. Why is that? If I, you know, if I go back to my workplace and I try to bring my buddies with me, they're going to think that's where they're not going to come. You know, so this is kind of the risk that we run in depending over much on middle class activists because middle class activists will behave like middle class activists. There is a long standing uh, obsession with kind of moral signaling and so on and so forth. Um, uh, you know that that comes with the territory and that kind of stuff is just uh, it's poison for your ability to attract regular working people. I, just in terms of the social significant social signifiers and uh, how it relates to socialist politics, uh, Tom reminds me from uh, back in uh, the day, uh, a key fight that took place within DSOC and DSA, uh, which I was on the losing side of. I grew up uh, as a uh, devout Catholic. I've been a devout Catholic for a long time, but I have a lot of friends who remained there. And one of the things that became a dividing line was that if you did not support abortion rights fully, you really couldn't be in DSA. Peter Steinfeld, who's a leading Catholic, left-wing Catholic intellectual, uh, actually has written a little bit about this, that his split with uh, DSA was not over a socialist demand, but over a liberal demand. Uh, but having been on the losing side of that debate, 
I think the people who beat me on that were right, that you that abortion rights is a fundamental dividing line in American society. It's particularly central to women's autonomy. And while it's not a socialist demand, it is an important part of the constituency we have to build. And it's going to turn off some people. It's going to particularly turn off uh, uh, evangelical Christians and pe particularly older Catholics. Uh, and that's a price we have to pay. Uh, but I, I come back to the cl class structure in this in, in America in the 21st century is extremely complex and multi-layered. Lots of working class, lots of college educated pe people are in the working class, and uh, the non-college educated population that's outside the working that is it in the working class is often outside our orbit. But it's it's a struggle about how, about how we reach them. And I'd get back to Tom's original question. I think one of the things, and I agree with Jamal here, the material conditions have changed very, very substantially. And when we were building those coalitions in the 80s, we didn't realize that the labor movement was gonna shrink as much as it did and lose as much power as it did. And that was always the major, in DSOC and DSA, historically, that was the loads, that was our North Star, so to speak. Uh, no, no reference to my current uh, caucus intended, uh, but that that was uh, the direction by which we guided ourselves. That we were tied to the labor movement uh, of DSA projects going on right now. Uh, I think some really good labor support works going on. I think of something like the uh, work to save the post office. That strikes me as really exemplary in terms of how you rebuild the links you need to build with the, with the working class institutions. Andrew, I was wondering if you would like to respond to this question, uh, especially regarding if a middle class, um, a middle class organization like the DSA can be the basis of a socialist politics and class struggle. Because you said in the, you said in your introduction, the task of the DSA is to become a mass working class organization. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and ultimately, I think it can't alone be the base of a working class organization. I think, but 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 I don't think. I can be reformed into a base or be prioritized into a base of a working class organization, I believe. I mean, I think we can look to organizations like like the South African Communist Party that, that, that like was a PMC party for a long time and then grew actual working class membership. Um, and and I, I, I think that is possible. I don't think it comes down to like, oh, we introduce ourselves with our preferred gender pronouns and, and therefore working class people don't come to our meetings. Like, that's not the center. It's just that we have to intentionally recruit um, working class members into an organization which to define our organization with a working class program um, that, that we can actually influence and, and, and build on that caters to working class people's material interests. And, and then I'm just going to touch on coalition building for like one second um, and, and organization that like I, I disagree with the dismissal of. Um, many of these organizations as just like parts of the Democratic Party or the uh, NGO uh, or the NPIC or whatever. Um, in, in that there is, I think, a reality that some of these organizations have far more outreach into working class communities than DSA does. And that that does really provide an opportunity. I know that I'm currently working with a, a local like sanctuary movement with undocumented immigrants to get them into like our work and coordinate. And I think that's like a real potential to actually intentionally recruit working class members of our society. Lance, you can address this question or not. Um, just, a, just a couple of quick things. I mean, again, I, I sort of like come from a, a more of a Leninist point of view where we say that we, that the Leninist party stands for the interests of the working class and it is, it's always about a political intervention into uh, the working class and, and, and the working class struggle. And so um, when we talk about fighting against oppression and making that something that's important, that's essential as being a socialist, you know, that the, that the socialist um, is trained to react to every slight, every, 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 um, you know, every uh, attack of um, against an oppressed person. 
Um, so I think that uh, I think that when we talk about race and class, and we're talking about um, the and, or or oppression and exploitation, you have to see those two things together. I mean, we talk about you know we should be organizing around the working class with where I think some of the question you know the key questions that are out there now have to do with all the things related to COVID. Well, I don't think you can realistically talk about organizing around the working class in COVID if you if you ignore race and class, or if you ignore race, if you ignore the um, uh, the dis disproportionate impact on people of color of uh, of COVID uh, and and the organ and uh, or 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 the or the you know you think about the uh, one a good my, a good friend who's actually in the DSA is um, a nurse or at organizer at, at Cook County where almost almost everybody in that in in the patients and almost all the nurses are um, are people of color. Uh, and immigrants. And so I don't think you can actually talk about these things separately from each other. And I also think, to me, in some ways, when I think about the long time I've been involved um, in, in various uh, movements, and, and a lot of time in the last 40 years of just working class defeat after defeat after defeat, one of the, the inspirations that I recall from the time I've been involved in stuff, to me, the March 10th movements, the mass marches of huge working class families against the um, Sensenbrenner bill for immigrant rights um, is probably one of the largest working class movements I've seen in my life. And, um, you know, we can have all sorts of critiques about what happened to it and where it went to the Democratic Party and this and that. But when it was actually organizing from the ground below, you could really see, you could see whole groups of workers in their working uniforms marching, you know, that's the kind of left that you want to build, that we want to be able to build. And, and you know, we actually want to see about, you know, if we're going to talk about actually building in the working class, that's the kind of stuff that's going to, that, that we have to, those are the kind of movements that we have to be part of and, and actually figure out how to, how to influence. And then the one other thing I'll say is that, you know, I, I, I do think that there is a sort of left culture and whatnot that can be alienating to people, but I also think that, um, that uh, more and more working people are open to all sorts of, um, of questions. I mean, the majority opinion in the country is in favor of um, same-sex marriage, and that includes a lot of working people um, that uh, uh, that uh, maybe not didn't think that way ten years ago. And so, um, I think that we have to keep that in mind. We don't have to, we can't have a kind of a stereotypical idea that um, fights against demands against oppression. Demands that make uh, that, that raise questions of race that make people uncomfortable. Somehow, that's that's a diversion against um, a class struggle. Actually, again, from the kind of point of view I come from, is that you want to win people to fight on those questions. You want to win white people to fight against racism, right? You want to win, as Jack said, you actually want to win people to be in favor of abortion rights, even if that actually happens to alienate people who are more conservative, because it's a fundamental question of women's self-determination. So I think we may actually go to Lou right quick because it, Jamal, this question actually is for you. Lou, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Jamal. Um, you had said um, that what Marxists need to be doing um, is not standing on the sidelines of DSA, but in fact, entering it and attempting to change things. Um, and you, of course, cite specifically class unity. So my question is, how is class unity asserting leadership of the DSA? Well, um, you know, we're, we're contesting uh, local chapter leadership elections um, in a variety of chapters, which I unfortunately won't name because I don't want to draw too much attention to them. But, um, you know, we're, we're doing the basic, uh, you know, democratic tasks of fighting for more democratic bylaws. You know, a lot of chapters um, try to rig their elections so that min minority tendencies aren't represented. Um, you know, we try to ensure that every chapter uses a proportional representation system for elections. Um, you know, we try to attend political education meetings and help to devise curricula that are properly Marxist and not, um, you know, just kind of reheated new left nonsense. Um, you know, and and fundamentally, you go, you you to participate in productive political work around unions, around Medicare for all, around universal childcare, what have you. You make friends, you make, um, you stick up for people who are being attacked, you know, for expressing supportive class politics, which happens all the time in DSA. Um, you know, like th this is, this is basic stuff. It's what 
you know, everyone here in the audience is perfectly capable of, of helping to do. It's very rewarding. You get to meet, you know, you get to make friends and meet nice people and, and shoot the shit and not really have to worry about stepping on anyone's toes because, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great time. Join Class Unity, classunity.org. Would anyone actually like to respond to Jamal's response? If not, we'll get to one last question. Andrew. I'll do a super quick 20 seconds. But I, I mean, there are chapters that are corrupt, I'll, I'll call them, um, that have majority tendencies that control a lot of the elections and have a lot of influence in the membership. But I'm just going to point out that vast majority of chapters don't have tendencies or caucuses in their bylaws are not actually official within chapters. Um, so yeah, th th that's the only point I was going to make. Yeah, I think that's a good point that a lot of people, whoops, a lot of people sort of overestimate how rigid the DSA's internal structures are. The D one of the DSA's major problems, and also one of its major advantages, um, is that it's very lackadaisical. You know, if, if you start coming to DSA meetings, um, you know, and making an argument, there isn't really much that people can do to kick you out. Um, and if you start organizing with your friends and coworkers, you know, to show up to DSA meetings and start voting as a block in local elections, you can get stuff done, you know, and if people do try to pick fights with you and they do try to kick you out, that can be an opportunity for you to polarize the membership around basic democratic principles and support for everyone's right to, um, you know, to ideological diversity within the DSA. So, um, yeah, I, I would agree with, uh, uh, um, with, sorry. Andrew, <laughs> I forgot your name for a second. Uh, I would agree with that, what Andrew just said that in the vast majority of chapters, um, you can participate democratically and you can get stuff done. Okay, we're gonna do one last question and we're gonna end it. Um, we're actually gonna go back to Ed because he asked an interesting question. Eddie there. Yes, um, thank you. Um, just another question relating to the history of uh, Shackmanism um, and, and the labor movement, which has come up a lot as essential, I think, to all of these visions of the DSA, its past, its present, and future. My question is, uh, Jack Clark's recounting uh, of the history of Shackmanism raises a deeper question. If it is not to be organized by a mass socialist party, uh, a la the Debsian Socialist Party of America 100 years ago, can the American labor movement ever reattain or surpass its former power, um, such as it had, for example, during the 1960s, arguably a heyday of its power and influence in American society and politics, without simultaneously being closely allied, as uh, uh, George Meany's AFL-CIO was, with the national and global imperatives of the US state, uh, including, you know, in that historical example, um, the global, uh, the, the commitment to the global fight against uh, communism in Vietnam as elsewhere, in, in, in Vietnam and elsewhere. In other words, um, you know, can you really avoid repeating that experience? C can you have a, 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 a labor movement that is simultaneously as large as it was um, and, and independent of such imperatives if it's not to be organized in and around a mass socialist party? Uh, I think the answer is yes, although I think socialists need to play an active role in trying to make sure the labor movement comes down on the right side of international uh, justice and international peace. Um, and socialists haven't always played that role. But the to use the phrase that a lot of people in this panel have been using, the material circumstances of the American working class have changed pretty substantially since the 1960s. And I think it's, I don't, I don't think it's debatable really, to say that in the immediate post-World War II period, American workers benefited from American imperialism. They, we, just, we just did. I and mean, it's, you know, we controlled the world's markets and uh, riches flowed to the hegemonic power. Uh, in the period starting around uh, 1970 with Nixon, you know, Nixon's declaring himself a Keynesian, uh, getting off the gold standard, all sorts of things, you saw the 
erosion or absolute destruction of some of the immediate, some of the international institutions that underlay the order that had then existed. Uh, and you also saw the, what everybody now refers to as a neo neoliberal push that started, was really starting very strongly back then uh, of saying we can really offshore more work, uh, we can get cheaper wages elsewhere. And it was an, ag an aggressive and very successful attempt to lower the standard of living in the American working class. So the American working class at this point objectively has an interest in the welfare of workers in Vietnam and the Philippines, which wasn't necessarily the case in, in 1965. Okay. We're gonna go a little bit over, but there's one. There's actually one last question. It's actually from Kevin. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, uh, thanks to all the panelists. This was a great panel. A lot of stuff got dis uh, discussed. Uh, so uh, Jack and Lance, you guys in your opening remarks. So Jack, you brought up the legacy of Shackmanism and uh, social democracy going back to the Second International. And Lance, you invoked uh, Cliffism, you know, Tony Cliff and also Trotskyism and Leninism. And so my question to you two is how do the respective leftist traditions you guys uh, cite uh, bear today on the left, which is to say, how are they necessary today? And for uh, Andrew and Jamal, there was noticeably a lack of discussion of the history of the left in the 20th century, both in your opening remarks and in much of the subsequent discussion. And so if only by omission, there is an, you know, quote unquote, implicit dirty break uh, endorsed with that history of the, 20, of the left in the 20th century. And so my question to Andrew and Jamal is, why is this implicit, quote unquote, dirty break with the history of the left in the 20th century? 20th century necessary for the left today. I'm willing to start. Uh, I think Max Schachman is an interesting historical figure. Uh, I think it's good to know some of what he did and some of the mistakes he made and some of the brilliant insights he came up with. Um, and I think in terms of what we do tomorrow morning or next year, he has almost no relevance. Uh, he just doesn't. Uh, it's, it's an interesting history, but it's not, it's not something he's currently, I, I just don't see. Uh, he, he was a very important figure in terms of understanding the, uh, the nature of the Soviet Union as not being a worker state. And that was a very important historical, historical contribution, but that's not a current debate. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think anybody in our ranks would argue that uh, uh, the People's Republic of North Korea is the model that we want to look at. Uh, and it just, it, it just isn't, it just isn't a current, current debate. I'd take that a step further. Michael Harrington was a mentor of mine, uh, a very close friend, uh, I think a brilliant intellectual. Uh, and Mike, um, there, there used to be a joke of, that ran around the uh, youth section of uh, DSOC and DSA about uh, revision, re uh, revisionism never. And Mike's line always was revisionism always. And I think that's not a bad way. Uh, I'll end my comments there. I think Mike, as much as I valued him and still value the insights he had, is not a reliable guide to where we need to be right now. I think there are elements of what he said that could still be relevant, but it's only relevant insofar as we interpret where we are and take his insights and apply them intelligently now. I, I, I just think these historical figures, all, I think all, many of them, uh, most of them are interesting people you want to learn from, and none of them are reliable guides to where we want to go next. I since that was directed to me too. Um, I'll start uh, with Shackman as well because uh, we're the uh, tradition I came from, the ISO, was um, sort of descended in some ways from Shackmanism, uh, but also 
broke with it. Uh, so that why we say we are, we, I sort of identify with the um, socialism from below of Hal Draper. Draper broke with Shackman over his anti-communism and accommodation to the Democratic Party. Uh, and so that's, that's where he, that's where Shackman ends up. And our tradition, you know, broke from that. Uh, the unfortunate thing, of course, now is that many of the ex leaders of the ISO are back in the DSA because they actually uh, moved back in the direction of the Democratic Party didn't didn't actually um, stick with that independent uh, point of view. So I think that to me, that's still a, a, an important thing. Uh, the the idea of class independence of um, uh, of uh, independence from the Democratic Party, and which in what in in my sense, what that means in the United States is that is independence from the Democratic Party. It's a hundred year old question. It's not that 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 it's been around for a long time, uh, and um, and so I think it's something that that we need to to take uh, to take seriously today. Even when I talk about Lenin. You know, and, and I don't uh, Lenin and Leninism. I, I don't mean to say that uh, everything that ever that Lenin ever wrote is 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 applicable to the United States today. But I think the question of leading with politics, of connecting, of bringing the political questions always into the working class struggle and not hiving it off into something separate, I think is a key insight of Leninism. And the fight against oppression is a key insight of Leninism. In fact, it was the you know the Communist Party of the, of the in the Soviet Union or the, the the Bolsheviks in the Soviet Union. They actually forced the American Communist Party to take the uh, the American Socialist Movement to take the question of race much more seriously um, than they had uh, before. Um, and so, uh, which you know is is a, is a key dividing is the key dividing line in the United States um, today. So uh, I think those are. Um, so those are things that I think are insights that come from us. Another is that, um, you know, you mentioned the court, court fight tradition, the, neither Washington nor Moscow. I think there's another, there's another um, small segment of the left that um, would, you might call campus, you know, that they believe um, that they think socialism or some kind of state control is still what socialism is. And therefore they look to I don't know anything from you know Assad's uh, government in um, in um, Syria to uh, to Venezuela to whatever uh, or North Korea <laughs> as an example of socialism, and I think you have to have a, a a position you know the position that I come from says that that isn't the case, and so therefore you know our vision of socialism is informed by that. So I think those are all things that actually are important points um, that I think are relevant today, and and, and socialism is. And Marxism is a, a constantly evolving, and, and as it as it sort of confronts the real world, and 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 makes um, uh, you know makes its uh, assessments of, of of the world um, as it is today. Um, just one thing on the question of oppression, I, I seem to notice looking down the list of commentary uh, comments that um, um, there are a couple of women did raise their their questions, and only men uh, spoke in this in this session. So uh, I know that may be may not be um, something that uh, some folks here might want, want to hear, but I just wanted to point that out. Um, I'd like to disagree very quickly um, with the notion that race is the primary dividing line in the United States. I don't think it is. I think that that class is fundamentally what occupies most people's uh, time and concerns. I think that is across the board true, whether you're black, white, Hispanic, or anything else. Um, and I think that it is very dangerous for socialists to go up to the working class um, when they fundamentally are more developed in their class analysis than we are and tell them, oh, no, actually, uh, race is the fundamental dividing line in the society. I don't think it's true. I don't think it's productive for socialist politics. Just one correction. Race is the fundamental dividing line in the working class, not the fundamental. I, was, I believe class is the fundamental divide in society as you know, a fundamental point of, of Marxism. Maybe if I could repeat the question I had for Jamal and Andrew, which is, you know, just to hear them, which is that there was a lack of discussion of the history of the left in the 20th century from you guys. And if so, if only by omission, there's like a sort of implicit endorsed dirty break with that history of the left. And so why do you guys, why is this implicit dirty break with the history of the left in the 20th century necessary for the left today? 
Um, I, I would just say that I think the new left was a comprehensive failure by every metric, and um, it's a waste of our time to try to learn any lessons from that except for negative lessons. Um, now, if you want to talk about the history of the early 20th century left before it started down that cul-de-sac, you know, the German Social Democratic Party and the Bolsheviks and so on and so forth. I'm not an expert in that, but I think that's a much more, you know, valuable use of our time than than trying to learn some squeeze some blood from the stone of the new left. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the the, the omission of talking about uh, the left within my opening remarks was n not intended to be an omission of the history of lacking a critical analysis of the left um, within a context. It was more of, I mean, I'll be honest, I have, I have like a lack of knowledge of what the post left was and I have uh, I have to learn more about the new left though I have more of a base on that. Um, but but ultimately I do think like in DSA, many of the political education groups, we are working on developing our own analysis of the but both the left at home in the early uh, 20th century as well as kind of the international left um, on a broader scale. I mean I, I know we're currently working on a, a, a larger um, political education uh, so, so surrounding the failure of the left within Ethiopia and Eritrea, as you've now seen kind of the civil war erupt in Ethiopia. Um, so so, so they, they, I think a critical left, his critical analysis of the left is, is super important. So I was not trying to omit its history within my opening remarks. Okay, so it's gone a bit over, but I'm still going to ask all the speakers just to get take two or three minutes each if you want to offer some closing remarks, or if not, um, and maybe fold in any remaining responses, answer the questions you have. And I think we'll start again with Andrew and then go to Jack, Jamal, and then Lance. I mean, ultimately, I'm set the same place I am before, and that like DSA is the only thing close to a mass working class organization within the US, it's the only thing. Um, that that really has the potential to build working class power within the U.S. and, and therefore is the only organization um, that, that that we can look towards to actually build. I mean, I'll, I'll comment. Uh, Jamal brought this up. I think that's actually extremely viable. Uh, DSA is a flexible organization. Um, DSA is not rigid. That is why DSA grew after the Bernie movement. That is why DSA continues to grow and is now near and close to 100,000 members. It is because it is up to the members who are in it. Um, and, and as a result, um, it, it, I think it is the only organization um, that can really build a strong uh, working class organization of politics and a strong socialist analysis of our current society. I'll keep it short. Okay. Um, the I can rattle off a few organizations of much more substantial membership that are working to build working class power. They're on the defensive, but the American Postal Workers Union, the American Federation of Teachers, the American Federation of State County Municipal Employees, Service Employees International Union. Um, and we place ourselves at the forefront of being the organize, organization of the working class at our peril. Uh, one other comment that I'll just make, Lance, very movingly talked about the demonstrations uh, around the Sensenbrenner bill and the uprisings of a largely Latino working class, but with a lot of non-Latino allies uh, on immigration. Uh, for all the problems of the Democratic Party, I would point out that that exact dynamic took place in California uh, almost 30 years ago. And the Democratic Party in California is what it is today because a lot of the a lot of the leaders of that movement just swamped the Republican Party and went in, went in and got people to vote. Down California Demo Democratic Party is nobody's ideal of a perfect organization, but it is the fact that it has been able to um, incorporate that social movement. I think is a good thing. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for for this panel. I think that this is exactly the sort of thing that the DSA needs more of, um, and the American left in general needs more of. Um, uh, I would say that, um, you know, if you've got a better idea for how to get involved politically than joining the DSA, um, I'd like to hear it, um, you know, for for the majority of people, um, you know, only 6% of the population is unionized, I think. Um, for the majority of people, it's got to be an organization like the DSA or some other left 
left organization that you could even could even join in the first place. Um, and so I would say, you know, DSA has its problems, um, but it, you know, who, who wouldn't have expected that it would have its problems? Um, it's still a site of political contestation. And if Marxists and those who are oriented towards class struggle politics um, actually participate fully um, in it, I think we could actually get some stuff done. Um, and if people want to sit on the sidelines and kind of complain that there isn't an actual Marxist organization in the United States for them to join, you know, well, <laughs> that's not going to drop out of the sky. And Lance? Yeah, uh, th again, thanks also as well for uh, inviting me and uh, for to be, to be part of this discussion. I think it's um, really important, again, to have more discussions like this. Um, and uh, uh, how you know, however, we disagree with with each other, and um, but but actually got got our positions on the on the table. Uh, you know, I, I I agree that DSA is is the current um, elephant in the room in terms of the the left and what it does and what it doesn't do. We'll actually have a lot to say about what happens with the left in the future. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, I believe that um, again that that still much of of what is to the future is to be written in the left is really going to be outside of the realm of, oh, I mean, it won't be completely disconnected from the kind of stuff we're talking about, but it's really going to be, um, uh, the, it's, it's going to be movements in society beyond us, crises that happen beyond us that are actually going to force, um, uh, you know, much more sharper political divisions uh, in which we'll see crystallizing of much more different tendencies that are now kind of together in the DSA, but could actually form into much more harsh um, divisions um, in the future, and I think that uh, it's out of that that we'll actually see the birth of a of a new, more uh, anti-capitalist left that can actually really meet the the challenges of today. The only other thing I'll just say is that I know there's a lot of talk about the working class, and a lot of people, and I think I think a lot of people in DSA are, are genuinely interested in um, working around unions and working in 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 um, in um, you know the working class. Um, struggle uh, but the other but the other thing to say is that it's largely fairly unglamorous work um, and it's not something that really happens overnight and it really is something that takes a long time of, of work and um, and uh, also some some you know boldness and everything uh, so um, yeah it's something that will that you know you 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 learn to do by doing, and sometimes it takes a long time to, to get there. So um, uh, it's good for us to have those discussions. It's good to have for us to have those, that orientation, um, because at the end of the day, what we're all all should be about is actually working class self emancipation. The workers, you know, the the workers themselves will make so socialism, and it won't be coming from politicians or from um, on high. Okay. Um, I'd like to give a huge thank you to all of you, all of our panelists today for their remarks. Um, we really appreciate them. So this has been a panel by the Northwestern University chapter of the Platypus Affiliated Society. So here again is the sign up sheet uh, for all those who actually want to get involved in our activities. Um, we would like for this discussion to remain open and to continue. If you'd like to submit your thoughts about this to the Platypus Review, you can email editor at platypus1917.org. So thank you all and have a good night.